Hi everybody, this is Brian David Marshall coming to you from Pro Tour Dark Ascension here in beautiful Honolulu. I'm here with Eric Froelich and we're here to talk about the new standard format with Dark Ascension. Uh, Eric, you, you've you spent, uh, you've taken full advantage of this Pro Tour, right? You're, you, you went to the Pro Bowl, you've been here for yeah. what, like 10 days? At least. I mean, it's definitely been closer to like two weeks. I think I'm spending two and a half total here. So I thought about spending more time after the fact. and. I, at this point, I kind of am ready to just get home because I've been for so long. But, you know, it's been great. There, been there is actually time. too much paradise? Well, you know, you just miss your friends, your family, your dog. Like, I love my dog. <laughs> but, uh, you know, home, home is still home. This is, a, I mean, I'll be back. Like, sure. let's, not, let's not kid ourselves. So Eric is sort of uh, like kind of an under-the-radar channel fireball guy sometimes. You, but you've had, uh, well, you haven't had the, the sort of like constant top eight success that like Luis has had. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you've put up some really insane numbers uh, on the Pro Tour in the last like two or three seasons since you've been back playing regularly. Right. Tell, tell people about uh, what your resume looks like these days. Um, in the last four Pro Tours, I had I did mediocre at Worlds, finished one match above 500, and got eighth at Worlds, ninth in Paris, and then 26th in Philadelphia. So three of my last four Pro Tours are pretty good. I've cashed the last seven or eight Grand Prix I've played. And, you know, yeah. I've done fine. I, ha I had one top eight before I stopped playing, you know, 10 years ago. And, you know, a Masters top four and a six and a or so Grand Prix top eight. It's like three or four top 16s, right? Like you were yeah. like you were like top 16, top 16, top 16. Yeah, I put up a, a good season of top 16s where I just <laughs> couldn't close. But, uh, you know, it, it's been fun. It was a long time ago. So uh, so you guys, are, you guys are in the beach house and you're tackling standard. And the, 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 the taste of defeat from Junior Iyanaga <laughs> is still reeking in your mouth. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, we, we couldn't play Tempered Steel after, uh, after Worlds. He just tore through all of us. And so, uh, you know, we, we decided to uh, take some of his ideas, go with some of the new cards from Dark Ascension that really put the deck, I think, over the top, allow you to lower your curve a little bit while still maintaining the power and just do some great things. So, so you, you, guys, you guys end up playing what's, I guess, known generically as Wolf Run Ramp. Exactly. And, and what, what are you thinking about as you first start trying to create your version of the deck? I think that the ramp in general is just a very powerful strategy, being able to cast extremely powerful cards, which we all know playing the game lately, that the Titan cycle has just been phenomenal. The cards just do so much. Primeval Titan, certainly near the top of that list, especially being able to get like the new you know, very powerful lands. And so being able to cast your Titans and your big spells early is always going to be a huge advantage. And so it's a deck that also can get a lot of mana quick that can play around mana leak. There's not a lot of hard counter spells that are just printed. So people have to play Dissipates, which doesn't go well in a lot of decks. And so, you know, you, you can really cast your spells, you can get them out there quick, and you can play around a lot of the format's best cards. So you can do a lot of powerful things. So, so talk a little bit about... Uh... Let's start up here with, with Rampant Growth. This is like the ramp in the, in, the, in the ramp decks. Sure, I mean, Rampant Growth is obviously an old staple. We have Tempest versions here. It's been around for a long time. It does, you know, what it does. It fixes your mana and it accelerates you. You know, it, it's just an absolute staple. Uh, you know, you mentioned the Titan Cycle. Of course. Uh, Pr Primeval is the only one that's in your deck. Primeval is the only one in my deck. A lot of the other members of the team are playing Inferno Titans. I decided to branch into a third color for, you know, what I felt was more powerful options. But, uh, you know, Infernal Titan is an option. Conley Woods played Grave Titan recently in a similar style deck. So there, there's a lot of good options. But, but Infer Infernal Titan, I mean, talk about, like, that card was one of the central cards that destroyed people in San Francisco at Worlds. Right. What, what has changed that that card is not quite good enough in your opinion anymore? Uh, in my opinion, I think a lot of the token decks have a lot of anthem effects, like Honor of the Pure and Tangible Virtue and the like, that their tokens are going to get to two twos fast enough that your Inferno Titan, when it comes down, is not going to do what you need it to do. It's going to kill a creature. It can block a creature and kill a creature next turn, but they can swarm you pretty fast. Uh, Champion is a card that becomes very big very fast. By the time you're casting a Titan, it's going to be well out of range. It doesn't hit Hero of Blade Hold, which I expect to be a popular card. Uh, also, people are playing a lot of Sword of Warren pieces, which both give your creature pro red, which makes Inferno Titan do nothing and it can't block. And if, there's a lot of ways to create creatures at the end of your turn by either casting Snapcaster Mage, making a Moreland Haunt token, casting Midnight Haunting, where you cast your Inferno Titan, and then you're looking down five power creatures, a sword comes down, you're taking 12 and the game's over. Like, right. So I, I did not think it was going to be a very effective tool. And you just don't get, rarely get that, like, I'm just going to kill three of your guys opportunity. The that thing is, even to when you before. do, it means they have so many other things out and there's so many other things happening that 
if they have three guys out that all have one toughness, you were probably winning the game anyway. And if not, then they have 30 guys out that are doing that. So sure. it just was not the card that I thought was going to be effective here. So the card that you did think that would be effective, this is not something we've seen in a lot of ramp decks right. or any ramp decks to this <laughs> point, is uh, Elish Norn Grand Centibite. Yeah. When Elish Norn comes down, it just ends the game. Like They can kill it, they can deal with it, but their board is still wrapped. Uh, they can't make more than hot tokens. They can't play mortar pods. Their anthem effects go, you know, null. Like they can't play end phase snapcaster mages. Their geists are going to die. It just shuts them completely out. They have to deal with it and then rebuild, which is just too much to ask for in general, especially when it's giving all your creatures plus two, plus two. It's just one of those cards that's going to end the game very fast, and you just really can't come back from it. It's that devastating. And uh, now, are you? How many people are playing this version of the deck, or is it? A large percent of the team is playing the actual Wolf Run deck with Green Red, but only myself and Conley Woods, I believe, decided to play the Elish Norn. And there's, and there's still a third option that exists, right, which you mentioned earlier, which is the Glissa. Well, the Green Red decks for a while did have Glissa and Ratchet Bomb splashing black instead of white, but it just wasn't doing enough. It, you know, you didn't really want to play one without the other, and neither card was powerful enough. The interaction was great. But coming out of your sideboard against decks like Mono Green, they have options like Phyrexian Metamorph. And what ends up happening when you play Galissa and they play a Metamorph to kill it, they also just get the Metamorph back. You just get blown out real bad. Right, and so, so it's, it's a legend. Right. So the two of them kill each other, but then the Galissa triggers, and since Metamorphs are an artifact, you yes. get to, yeah, that's and so, <laughs> pretty exciting. I mean, <laughs> you're just losing so much value there. And people are going to be prepared for, you know, Glissa Ratchet Bomb if you're playing a deck that's bad against it after sideboard to have options like Metamorph available. And so I, we just didn't feel like it was going to be worth that splash. Sure. So let's just talk a quick, you know, you have the Sphere of the Suns yes. and Solemn Simulacrum as your other two uh, kind of ramp components. Yes. Being able to have colorless mana fixers is huge in a deck where you want to play Ink Moth Nexus and Kessig Wolf Run. And so those cards are just absolute superstars. Uh, and you have two green sun zenith, mm -hmm. not, not four. What, what's? You really don't have a lot of time to be setting up late green sun zenith, and you are playing four of your relevant creatures. And so being able to go and get a birds of paradise to ramp when you don't have one is a very nice option. And being able to get your one acidic slime when you need it is also key. But it's not a card that you actually want to draw a lot of. Right. Or so very you're, often. you actually have like a little. A little sort of Green Sun Zenith package. Right. Uh, a throne, an acidic slime, and a super gorgeous beta Birds of Paradise. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Never leave home without it. Um, okay, so we, we've talked a little bit about that, but you have uh, like really one kind of big Dark Ascension card right. that you feel is uh, like a, a pretty important cog in this deck. Yeah, this was the card that like our entire team was very much drawn to early on. That. You know, Brian Kevo was building a lot of green, red, more mid-range aggressive decks and just showing that this card was just fantastic. Like, it does so much. It's basically like a mini Titan, but it costs four mana. And so you can easily cast it. You can get it turn three very easily. You know, and it was a card that started off in a lot of decks as a one of, quickly went to a two, and we, then we all realized we wanted to be playing four in all of our decks. And just to show you the other side there, the Ravager of the Fowls when he gets yes. the flip. And not many people realize that thing has Trample too. Multiple times already in this tournament. It's only been two rounds and it's already come up. I, I actually heard someone say, oh, I made, I made a terrible mistake. I didn't, you know, I didn't block, you know, set up so that I could double block a Ravager of the Fowls. I didn't know it had trampled. My Soren died. <laughs> My guy that I blocked died. I right. died. Everyone was dead. Yes. The card just does so much. If you have some, you know, cheaper spells you can cast so that you can flip it back when you need to, to gain more life, make more blockers. It's just, it's just good against every deck. It's just a great card. So let's talk a little bit about the land in the deck. Sure. So, uh, again, beautiful beta mountains. Uh, five, uh, you know, a little, little kind of, these are a little <laughs> less beautiful, your forest. Do you not play a lot of, a lot of forests? And, like, put the nicer ones on top. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not, a, I'm not a big forest player. I don't play too many Dungrove Elders and <laughs> stuff like that. I, I have a lot of beta islands that are very beautiful, but <laughs> uh, they, they could not come out for this tournament. Uh, two planes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, start targets your rampant growth and your, your solemn simulacrum. Right. The, the mandatory package of eight, eight dual lands. Mm -hmm. uh, for Ink Moth Nexus, how, how often is this card your win condition? Uh, it's not necessarily your win condition as much as your, like, when you cast Primeval Titan against a lot of the decks in this format, they're very aggressive. So you need to get two Ink Moth Nexus. What they do is they block. Like, they're a very good blocker. They shrink, you know, opponents creatures, whatever it blocks, and they can block any sword. Right. And you and can so, actually affect a Geist of, of St. Traft, for example. Absolutely. And so 
what you can also do is like in combination with Wolf Run, just defensively, you're able to kill any creature too, just by you know poisoning it out and infecting it. So of course, the 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 eponymous deck, card of the deck, that the Keswick Wolf Run, that that makes it all sort of so inevitable, right? Yes. I mean, Keswick Wolf Run with cards like Theron that have hexproof or creatures that have you know infect. It's just you got to deal with it. There's no good way to deal with it. It's inevitable. You got all this mana out, and you just have returning fireballs. So, so re returning fireballs. Speaking <laughs> of returning um, channel fireballs, you guys were hoping to uh, maybe get a little re revenge on Ianaga. What was the fantasy <laughs> about this pro tour? Uh, Luis drew up the scenario that he would play Ianaga in round one, and then Conley would play him in round two, and then Matt Nash would play him round three in the O2 bracket, and then Brad would beat him in the O3 bracket. <laughs> And so we keep going. To, at I that point, it. we figured we'd all be out of the bracket, so we were safe. But uh, that that was the running joke going on this week that, uh, you know, get, get a little bit of payback and give some daggers to a couple members of the team. <laughs> awesome. So uh, there you have it. This is a, a first look at a new Dark Ascension-powered Wolfren ramp deck, uh, maybe slightly off the beaten path with the Elish Norn. But, you, again, you're saying Inferno Titan, is this is not his season. It's not his season. But uh, I think the key from this whole deck and all of my testing is check out Huntmaster of the Fells. This card is phenomenal. Like, the things it does is just ridiculous. It's, it's like a Loxon and Hierarch that's actually capable of punching you in the mouth a little bit. I mean, the th it just starts flipping and stuff gets out of control real quick. Like, it is a tough card to beat. It, you know, two guys, two life is already great. And then it just gets better. Somehow your four drop turns into a seven drop. That just shocks them, shocks their creature. Four, four trample. Like, that's just not fair. All right, well, for Eric Froelich, this is Brian David Marshall signing off from the Tournament Center at Pro Tour Dark Ascension.